nature versus nurture debate. This case argues both. A night threat posed as a trustworthy person. In truth, he was anything but. This is The Shit Detectives. The Vampiric Horror. Hello Shit Detectives and welcome to another podcast episode. Today, sadly, it is just me as Hex Echo is unavailable. I am Inquisitive Turtle. Today's case is one of the earlier cases of a serial killer whose criminal activity earned him the name The Vampire of Dusseldorf. This case is the case of Peter Curtin. I'm now going to go into the trigger warnings. So, when I tell you that this case is incredibly dark and heavy, I mean it. There is a trigger warning for everything. The worst of the worst happens in this case. I'm not even kidding. I think there's everything but bombs, but there is even war references. Gun use, arson, blood drinking, SA, neglect, childhood abuse, R wording, bestiality, torture, necrophilic acts, and execution. If you decide that this particular case is too much for you, we completely understand and your mental health is far more important to us. It is not an exaggeration to say that this case is a very heavy one. As I'm doing it on my own this week, um, I am going to be putting in regular breaks where I'll just talk about something else for a bit. With that out of the way, let's begin by delving into the background of Peter Curtin. Peter Curtin was born in 1883. The family he was born into was a poverty-stricken, abusive family in Mulheim am Rhein. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. He was the oldest of 13 children, although two of his siblings died at an early age. Both of his parents were alcoholics who lived in a one-bedroom flat. His father would regularly beat his wife and kids, particularly if he was drunk. One horrific account was later recalled that Peter's father would get them all to line up in the living room and force his wife to strip and have sex with him while the children were forced to stand and watch. His father was later arrested for the repeated R word of his eldest daughter who was 13. At this point, his mother separated from his father and they relocated to Dusseldorf. Whilst growing up, Curtin is said to have later confessed to having made an attempt to drown one of his playmates in 1888 and four years later he befriended a local dog catcher who lived nearby and began accompanying him on his rounds. This individual regularly tortured and killed animals that he caught and it wasn't long before Peter also started joining him. Academically he would do well, but since he was the eldest son he was regularly targeted by his father and would frequently refuse to go home from school. Peter later stated that he would do well at school, but felt that his academics fell when his father was around in comparison to the 18 months that he served in jail for R-wording Peter's sister. As a result, Curtin would frequently run away from home, where he made acquaintances with petty criminals as social misfits. They taught him various petty crimes in order to help him survive life on the streets, and initially, this meant that he could keep himself clothed and fed, but later, he would use this for his other criminal acts which brings us to the first alleged murders. When he was nine, two of Peter's school friends sadly drowned while they were playing together on a log raft. In later life, Curtin claimed that he had pushed one of his friends overboard because he knew that they could not swim. And when the other boy tried to help him, he claimed that he had held his head underwater to drown him. However, both deaths were ruled as accidental and that has never been reinvestigated. So the validity of these claims has to be cast into doubt especially since it doesn't fit what would be his regular modus operandi. At 13 years old, Curtin started to gain an interest in sex. He formed a relationship with a girl who was his age, and although she allowed him to be intimate, she refused all the attempts that he made to have sex with her, leaving him in a desperate situation where he felt the only way to resolve it was to resort to bestiality, which if you aren't aware, is sex with animals. Curtin later claimed that he would need to stab animals in order to achieve an orgasm. He was adamant, however, that he ceased the behaviour after someone caught him with a pig. It is also alleged at the time that he tried to R-word his sister. Yes, the one that his dad had previously R-worded. Curtin was able to leave school in 1897. His father insisted that he get a job as an apprentice. 
This position lasted for a mere two years before Peter stole all the money in his house, plus around 300 marks, which is approximately £132 in today's currency, from his employer, before running away from home again, where he settled in Coblenz and formed a relationship with a prostitute who he claimed willingly performed every sexual perversion which he demanded. Four weeks later, he was apprehended and charged with theft and forced entry, and he went to prison for a month and upon his release returned to his life of crime, which brings us to his first official attempted murder. When he was confessing his crimes, Curtin claimed that his first attempt at murder was when he met an 18-year-old girl in November 1899 outside the Alastrasse and persuaded her to accompany him to the Hofgarten, where he claimed they had sex before strangling her with his bare hands until she lost consciousness. He said he left her there because he believed she was dead However, records don't cooperate with his claims. In fact, there are no records of a corpse matching this poor girl's description, so it's believed that if such an attack happened, that she survived. However, this didn't stop Peter from claiming that he had the highest feeling of ecstasy and proved to himself that he needed to be harming the thing that he was doing the nasty with. In 1900, Curtin was later arrested for forge twice within the same year. However, on the second indictment, the charges from the aforementioned Dusseldorf thefts were included, as was an attempted murder with a firearm charge against a girl, resulting in him having to serve four years in prison. Upon his release, Peter was then drafted into the Imperial German Army, wherein he was deployed to Lorraine to serve in the 98th Inf Infantry Regiment. However, it wouldn't be long before he deserted his post. That same autumn, he began to perform acts of arson and would take pleasure in watching from a distance to see if any tramps, a ye olde word for homeless person, had been caught in the flames as an emergency services tackled the blaze. He confessed these crimes on New Year's Eve the same year. He was then tried by military court and incarcerated from 1905 to 1913, where he spent a lot of time in solitary confinement for insubordinate behaviour. He claimed that he found the idea of punishment sexually arousing, to the point where if he thought of it as a sexual fantasy, occasionally there would be an incident of spontaneous ejaculation. Now we're moving on to the murders for certain. On the 25th of May, 1913, Curtin, whilst committing a robbery of a tavern, happened on a poor innocent, Christine Klein. He strangled her, drew his pocket knife, and slashed her throat twice. He is reported as saying that he liked the sound of her blood dripping from the wounds to the floor. Drip, drip, drip. So much so that he ejaculated. Christine Klein was just nine years old. Curtin said the next day he specifically targeted a tavern opposite to where the murder took place so that he would hear the reaction to the discovery and aftermath. He said it gave him a sense of gratification. He said he also frequented the grave and when he touched the ground where she was buried, it triggered spontaneous ejaculation. As this was two months later, using a skeleton key, Curtin broke into a home in Dusseldorf where he discovered 17-year-old Gertrude Franken asleep in bed. He once again manually strangled her and got sexual gratification at the sight of the blood coming from her mouth. He then left the scene and fortunately she did survive. Days after the attack on Gertrude, he was arrested but not for murder or attempted murder. Nope. He was arrested for arson and burglary and was sentenced to six years in prison but once again his sentence was marred with insubordination which saw his sentence extended by a further two years in military prison. Due to the depravity of this case, I am going to take a break here for a minute. Let everyone just decompress and process all that I've just mentioned and have a bit of a break before I delve any further. Go pop the kettle on, go recentre, go do what you need to do. While in this break, I hope that you guys can forgive a bit of a shameless plug but empty airtime isn't necessarily good airtime. I'm going to take this time to remind you all to check us out on TikTok where we post our teaser clips of upcoming episodes and we have our two mini series. The first is Turtle Tales where I dive into the Brothers Grimm Tales which is uploaded every Tuesday bearing any technical mishaps and the second mini series is Echoes of the Past where Echo looks into the haunting legends and gruesome folklore. And if you do like true crime content, please do remember to click that like button 
subscribe and press that notification bell to keep up to date with our uploads. Now back to the case as we delve into how Peter Curtin started settling down. Upon his release in April 1921, Curtin relocated to Olsenburg to live with his sister. It was through his sister that he made the acquaintance of a woman named August Schaaf. She owned a sweet shop, but she too knew of the life of crime, having previously worked as a sex worker and previously serving a conviction as she had shot her fiancé to death. August would later marry Peter, and although he was forthcoming about his need for violence to receive sexual pleasure, they regularly consummated their wedding at her request. He later said that he would try to fantasise about his previous acts of violence against other individuals whilst in consummation with her. My god, quite a pair, aren't they? He also got a job, but apart from his wife, he had no other close relationships. In 1925, he and August returned to Dusseldorf, where he began to have affairs with two women, a servant girl named Tida and a housemaid named Meth. He regularly partially strangled them, and when challenged on it by Tida, he merely stated that that's what love means. Tida reported him to the police when his wife discovered Curtin's infidelity. Tida claimed that she had been seduced by Curtin, and Mech claimed that Peter had R-worded her. Mech later dropped the allegations, but Tida maintained it. So Peter was given yet another prison sentence. Initially, he was sentenced to eight months in prison, but he managed to negotiate down to six months if he agreed to leave Dusseldorf after his time. He later appealed the relocation and was permitted to stay. Which brings us to his return to murder. On the 3rd of February 1929, Curtin stalked Apollonia Kuhn. Peter was hidden from view, waiting until the middle-aged woman was obscured from view behind some bushes before seizing her by the lapels of her coat, instructing her not to cause a row by screaming. He dragged her further into the bushes before stabbing her violently 24 times with a pair of scissors, some wounds going so deep that they nicked bones. Fortunately, Apollonia survived her injuries. Just five days later, he was back on the prowl. This time his victim was a young girl called Rosa Offliger. He pounced on the nine-year-old girl, strangling her until she was unconscious, before he then proceeded to stab her in various locations, spontaneously ejaculating as he did this. He then did something that if we'd spoke about, we'd get taken down. He hid her body in the undergrowth before returning later and setting the remains on fire, achieving yet another orgasm at the sight of flames. Rosa's body was discovered the next day. Again on the 13th of February, Peter attacked and killed Rudolf Scheer. He returned to the scene after Rudolf was discovered under the false pretense of hearing about it on the phone. These three attacks had all been in the same area, leaving police to believe they had a serial killer amongst them. When making his confession, Curtin claimed to have strangled four other women, but nothing was ever found. His next known attack wasn't until the 11th of August, when he R-worded and violently attacked Maria Hahn. Unlike his previous victims, he attempted to earn her trust first by going on dates, and then on the 11th of August, he lured her into a meadow so he could kill her. He is reported as saying that she was begging him to spare her as he attacked her. He hid his clothes in a cornfield and after several weeks had intended on returning to the scene to stage the body in a mock-up crucifixion. However, Mariah's earthly remains were too heavy for him to carry out this act, so he returned her body to where he had buried it again. In his confession, he described how he kept returning to the scene, picturing what he had done to the poor girl who lay beneath where he stood and how he found satisfaction in that. Three months later, Peter wrote a letter to the police confessing to her murder and details which also mentioned how she would be positioned and where to locate her, which he included a roughly sketched map to her location, which meant that her body was later discovered that November. After Han's murder, Peter changed his weapon to try and convince investigators that there was more than one person committing these attacks. In three separate but very close attacks, he attacked an 18-year-old, a 30-year-old and a 37-year-old. They all described their attacker as silent, speaking not a word before pulling his weapon to leave them gravely injured, although fortunately they all survived. Only three days would pass before Peter Curtin would strike again. He saw two stepsisters aged 5 and 14 walking from the fairground. He sent the older of the two on an errand to purchase cigarettes for him in exchange for money. As she watched her sister enough, 
The poor five-year-old was lifted off of her feet by her neck and losing consciousness as Peter began strangling her. Peter then slit her throat and discarded her remains in a vegetable patch. Upon her return, the eldest of the two girls was partially strangled and erratically stabbed, before Peter bit her on the neck and sucked blood from her wounds. Unlike other crimes of his, there was no obvious sexual element at play here. The very next day, Kirsten advanced on a housemaid called Gertrude Short, asking her to have sex with him. When 27-year-old Gertrude rejected him, he said, Well, die then, before attacking her. Though Gertrude survived, she couldn't provide the police with a good description, merely that she thought him to be in his 40s. Peter attempted two more murders before once again changing his weapon of choice to a hammer that September. Kirsten met Ida Luta. He persuaded 31-year-old Ida to accompany him to a nearby cafe and then a walk down the river. It was on the river that he pulled her out of view and whacked her on the head repeatedly with a hammer and R-worded her before he once again decided to beat her with the hammer. At one point he reported that he had to give her additional beatings because she regained consciousness and began to plead for her life. In October, 11 days later, Curtin attacked Elizabeth Doria. Once again, asking to escort her, and once again walking beside a nearby river, where he struck her with a hammer, R-worded her, and then left 22-year-old Elizabeth for dead. She succumbed to her injuries the day following her discovery, not awakening from her coma. On the 25th of October, two women were attacked by an assailant who was armed with a hammer. Very luckily, both women survived, though in the instance of the second woman, it's suspected that the assailant, Peter if you haven't been following along, broke his hammer while attacking her. His final victim, he returned to its murderous operandi and led five-year-old Gertrude Alberman to the allotments, where he stabbed her once in the temple with his weapon of choice, the scissors, and strangled her until she fell soundless to the ground. That's his description there. He then stabbed her an additional 34 times before leaving her in an overgrown patch of nettles near to a factory. Again, I am going to take a break here, just for a minute, because of the heaviness to all of this. I would like to take this time to remind you that if you like this video and what we are trying to do here, educating on a variety of topics through using true crime, please do click on that subscribe button and the notification bell to stay up to date. Please don't forget to give this video a like, it really helps us out in the algorithm and please check out our previous episodes. Your support is greatly appreciated. Also, we have an update on the situation with Tonks. If you've been following us from the beginning, you know that she was taking a bit of a break for her own mental health. She is not returning. Should this change, we will keep you updated, but it's highly unlikely that that's going to be the case. She has opted to withdraw from the podcast. Now, back onto the case. And we are now on the investigation. By 1929, the press had reached the same conclusion as the investigators and dubbed the unknown assailant as the Vampire of Dusseldorf. The case receiving a lot of attention for the sheer level of violence and the ever-changing methodology of the victim's profiles, as well as the selection of weapons, it all made international news. Thanks to this, the investigators then received 13,000 letters from members of the public coming forward with information and potential persons of interest based on the descriptions, which led to 9,000 people being interviewed with help from neighbouring police services. And even then, 900,000 were on the potential suspect list. Without looking it up, I think that's more than the Yorkshire Ripper, one of the UK's most infamous serial killers. I don't think that I've forgotten the earlier mentioned map that Curtin sent to the police. A local newspaper received a very similar map and letter two days after Gertrude Alberman's death, detailing the position of the body and the location. Handwriting experts later determined they were the same person who had done the map that had led to Han. Though the investigation was narrowing down on Peter, his attacks were still going, however none of them were fatal. That was until a young lady called Maria Budlick came to Dusseldorf in search of work in the May 1930. Instead, she encountered a man who, whilst escorting her to a local hospital, kept trying to take her down secluded paths, which made her very suspicious. So the savvy 20-year-old confronted the man until another member of the public offered her assistance, to which she gladly went with her saviour. Unbeknownst to her, her saviour was a serial killer named Peter Curtin. He invited her to his apartment to have something to eat and drink 
before Maria explained that she would not be having sex with him. Seemingly, Kirsten was okay with this, and he offered to escort her to a hotel. She agreed to this, but instead he led her into the woods, where he grabbed her by the throat in an attempt to strangle her as he R-worded her. She began to scream, and Peter released Maria, who went home and wrote a letter to her friend detailing the attack. She had addressed it incorrectly in her shaken state, and as a result of the incorrect address, the letter was intercepted and the contents read and sent on to police. Maria was located by police and she directed him to Peter's house, where his landlady confirmed that she had seen Maria and Peter leaving together and gave the police the name of her tenant, which was obviously Peter Curtin. Peter was out at the time of the police and Maria attending his flat, but when he spotted them in the communal hallway on their way out, he confessed to his wife, telling her only of the R words and how due to his other offences, he was looking at an extensive 15 year sentence. In response to this, she granted him permission to stay away, which he did until the 23rd of May, where he returned to his wife and decided to confess to being the monster who prowled the streets and begged her to be the one to turn him in, which would allow her to claim the reward for his capture. The next day, August Curtin contacted the investigators. She said despite his previous conviction, she truly didn't suspect a thing, but that he had confessed his guilt to her and she had convinced him to do likewise with the police. She added that they had arrangements to meet outside St. Rosia's Church later in the day. Thanks to this information, Curtin was arrested and he freely confessed to all of his crimes, including some additional ones that were previously unsolved. In total, he admitted his guilt in nine murders and 31 attempted murders and various other crimes, which all told, with the murders included, meant that he had confessed to 68 crimes. Throughout his confessions, he maintained that none of his child victims were tortured. When being evaluated by investigators and psychiatrists alike, he mentioned about the sight of blood bringing him to the brink of an orgasm, and if he were to climax while strangling them, he would later apologise to them. He said, true to his vampire title, he had drank blood from one victim's throat, from the temple of another, and licked the blood from the third victim's hand. He stated that in 1913 he had killed 1913. That's neat trick. He stated that in 1930 he had killed a swan and drank the blood from the wound, and he achieved ejaculation in the process. Pre-trial, Curtin was interviewed by a psychologist, Dr. Carl Berg. During these interviews, they discussed motives behind his criminal activity, which Peter maintained was entirely sexual. There was evidence to support that from an early age he had associated sex with violence, sight, and the taste of blood. This was especially the case when he couldn't have human contact. The majority of his attacks happened on nights when his wife had been on shift at her place of work, and the amount of wounds would differ depending on how long it took him to achieve ejaculation. Peter also revealed that he felt relief when he saw his victim's blood. Freud would love you. Through an intensive investigation and interviews, Peter was declared sane and deemed fit for trial. At the trial in 1931, he pled not guilty through reason of insanity to each of the nine counts of murder and the seven counts of attempted murder. During the trial, he was kept in a shoulder-high cage that was heavily guarded to keep him protected from the attack of angry families of victims. However, several days later, he instructed his lawyers that he wished to change his pleas from guilty, stating an address to the court, quote, I have no remorse. As to whether recollection of my deeds make me feel ashamed, I will tell you that thinking back to the details is not at all unpleasant. In fact, I rather enjoy it." End quote. He was then questioned about his motivation for confessing, to which he responded by asking the lawyer why they couldn't understand that although he did many wrongs to his wife, he was deeply fond of her and wanted to make sure that she'd be settled in her old age. Dr. Berg was called forward and asked to testify about Curtin's mental state. He said much of what I've just previously covered, but added that he believed sexual motivation to be 90% of a sadism root and the remaining 10% being in revenge because of his neglectful parents and his time in prison. He also mentioned that he didn't feel that Curtin was a necrophiliac and that the few times he did commit those types of acts, it was to extend the fantasy. On cross-examination, they argued that to engage in the acts that Peter did, he had to be insane, as no sane person would wish to do this to a person, even with premeditation. All in all, the trial lasted 10 days. When the jury were deliberating, they only needed two hours before they reached a verdict, and he was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to death. 
Peter Curtin showed no emotion, but in his final address, he said he now knows that what he did was wrong and saw his crimes for the ghastly events that they were. He also stated that such ghastly acts shouldn't have an excuse attributed to them. He never appealed his sentence, but did submit for a pardon of the capital punishment to a judge who was known to be against it. However, his request was denied, and when Peter received that news, he asked for some papers to write apologies to the victims of his families and to his wife. He also asked to see a confessor. These were all given to him. He had his last meal of a wiener schnitzel, a bottle of white wine and fried potatoes, and he was also given an additional helping of his last meal. Then, at 6am on July the 2nd, 1931, Curtin approached the guillotine with a priest and psychiatrist behind him. Before his head was on the device, he asked the psychiatrist if for the brief seconds that he lingers after he's separated from his body, he would be able to hear his own blood from the wound, before declaring that it would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. His final words were, no, in response to if he had any final words. And after that, his time in this earth was done. Following this, his head was bisected, which means cut into two, mummified, yes, like they did in ancient Egypt, and his brain was removed, and they gave him a very thorough analysis, known as an autopsy, in an effort to determine what could have caused such heinous urges to a terrible degree. Curtin's brain, however, showed no abnormalities. In fact, the only abnormality was that Peter had an enlarged thymus gland. Normally, uh, Echo would be doing a coverage of what that effect. Sadly, as previously mentioned, Echo is not available today, but she did take the liberty of breaking it down for us. So I'm going to do the info dump. Okay, so let's break this down a bit. It sounds as though Peter has thymic hyperplasia. The word thymus means soul in Greek, which stems from the belief that it houses the soul. It is an essential organ of the immune system and its dysfunction can drastically affect a patient's quality of life. Hyper is a prefix in medicine meaning high, beyond, excessive or above average. Plasis or plasia being suffixed meaning formation, growth or proliferation. Thymic hyperplasia is an increase in size and weight of the thymus gland that is otherwise normal. In other words, it is a condition in which the thymus gland is inflamed. It is a benign condition and can be associated with a number of other medical conditions. It's usually a rebound phenomenon after atrophy caused by corticosteroids or chemotherapy and it occurs several months after resolution of the cause of atrophy. Occasionally, it may be the result of hypothyroidism. Thymic hyperplasia is an abnormal growth of the thymus and the thymus becomes enlarged. It is often described with other non-cancerous tumours of the thymus but it is not an actual tumour. The thymus is located in the chest behind the breastbone. It is in front of the ascending aorta, which is the large blood vessel that comes from the heart, and it plays a key role in the immunity by producing white blood cells known as T-cells. It also contributes to the production of hormones such as insulin. The organ's primary function is maturing T-cells or T-lymphocytes. These are white blood cells responsible for fighting infections. Additionally, the thymus produces an array of hormones. Some of these, like thymulin and thymosin, regulate the immune cell production. The thymus also synthesizes hormones such as insulin and melatonin. It is relatively large in infants and children, and after puberty it decreases in size and is very small in older adults. Additionally, according to a 2016 study, the thymus depresses the effects of ageing. Hormones released by the thymus inhibit the aging processes. They also help retain learning and memory capabilities. So basically that means that the autopsy found absolutely nothing. Zilch, nada, nothing as to why he did what he did. So what happened to Peter's head? Well currently, according to Wikipedia, because it's the only place where I could find any information about his head, it is on a display in Wisconsin. However, given that, that mu the claim in the museum is a Ripley's believe it or not, I'm not entirely 100% on that, as my experience of Ripley's was the one in London where it was more... Oh, look, you're upside down. Oh, look, you're Alice in Wonderland. It's more Alice in Wonderland-y than here's the severed and bisected head of a serial killer. But it might be there. I thought it was um, on display in the Museum of Human Bodies, but apparently not. 
So now we're going to move on to our thoughts and opinions. Echo has kindly sent me her thoughts. I will read them first. In all honesty, I have no idea what to say about this case. After editing the script and then going through it to make sure that it was all okay, I just, oh my god, I'm so glad that we agreed to add breaks to this episode because it's such a disturbed and deprived case. I do feel that what did contribute to it was the environment that he grew up in. A lot does seem to originate in nurture, but at the same time, I do wonder how much could also be nature. His father was a disgusting, deprived creature who tortured his kids, and Peter became a monster moulded from that. I think that it's likely to be a combination of nature and nurture, perhaps a gene that was handed down from his father, and then his experiences as a child combined together to produce such a despicable monster. But I'm going to hand it to you guys. What do you think? Nature, nurture, a combination of both. Please do let us know in the comments. Now I'm going to do my own opinion because I haven't gone through all of this to not say my opinion. I just, honestly, I have no words, no no thoughts. Every time I try and formulate one, my opinion becomes, um, what? This was one of the hardest episodes I've ever written up about. And there was just so much to write up about that I thought this episode would end up being a two-parter and I nearly, nearly cried. The trauma that this man has put so many people through and it's all because of his parents' actions and the time that he served in the military and his various prison stint. I do think that he's telling the truth about having no remorse. His confession and the way he went about it were only from necessity. The nets were closing in and it's my duty as a husband to ensure my wife is catered for type thing. Don't forget this is the 1930s. In terms of nature versus nurture, I think it's really hard to decide if that's the case with Peter because genealogy wasn't a thing back then and if it was, it was in his infancy. So it's not like they could use it and form anything constructive. I think that there may have actually been more to his autopsy now that the medical field has developed, we'd understand it. However, that being said, his, I think that anything abnormal would have been noted down in great detail and with great care and attention because of the fact that they wanted to know what could cause such a deprived act to such an extent and such violence as to things that we cannot even discuss on the episode. It was horrible and it was cruel and my thought goes out to the descendants of the families if there are any and if they're still with us because it must just like if you're doing your family tree and then you hear that your victim was your real family your great aunt or whatever was one of those people that must be harrowing and then to hear about this entire case that just must be so so hard so anyway that's all from this week's episode it's definitely been a roller coaster i hope that everyone is okay uh i think for sure that moving forward we're going to be taking a bit of a break from murders for a little while and that we'll be back with a new episode that won't be quite so heavy next week. Please keep an eye out on our social media for all of our posts and give them a like and a share and a follow. We're on most social platforms. We have our two mini-series, as I mentioned, and we post the thumbnail, teasers, and episode announcements on our Facebook page, our Instagram page, our teasers go up on our TikTok. We're making the switch over to threads from X given the news of the impending charges. Um, it's the same handle as our Instagram handle. The only thing that happens is that I need to remember that threads exist. 
thank you very very much for watching see you at another time bye